I'm going to ask you a question because I think it will help a lot of people, but it's also going to make a handful of you really angry. Now, if you've ever sought professional help for trauma related symptoms, you had every right to expect that the practitioner's expertise and the treatments you tried would help you feel better and support you in making lasting changes in your life. So here's my question. Did you feel better? There are good and caring practitioners out there and some treatments that many people find helpful. And if you've had good results with any of these, then stay with them, but keep listening. A lot of us who were abused or neglected as children have found little benefit or have not been helped at all by the industry standard approaches to trauma healing that are widely accepted as the approach, namely talk therapy and medication. There is not very good evidence that this approach is the most effective or even effective at all for complex PTSD. And that's the kind that comes from chronic ongoing intense stress, which could develop at any time in your life, but it's usually from trauma in your childhood. Now, if you had a disappointing experience with the treatments you've tried, you may have thought it was just you but it may have had more to do with the fact that these methods didn't specifically help you with what we now know is the core symptom of CPTSD, neurological dysregulation. And trying to work through trauma while you're dysregulated can make dysregulation even worse. Now, if you're new to my channel, we talk a lot about dysregulation here. You may have noticed that under stress, you get discombobulated, you get spaced out or clumsy, maybe your handwriting changes, you can't focus and you get prone to making not so good decisions or you lash out at people saying things you wish later that you could take back. Everybody gets dysregulated sometimes, but traumatized people are more susceptible to it. We get dysregulated more easily, maybe more often, and we stay dysregulated longer, harder time getting back from it. And one thing that pushes people into dysregulating is talking about trauma, which is a kind of big focus of talk therapy, right? Which is one reason why it can be so hard to benefit from talk therapy when you're still very much affected by past trauma. So what can you do? In this video, I'm going to go through some of the popular treatments out there and tell you what we know so far about them. And if you've been trying and trying to get help for problems connected to your own childhood trauma, you're going to want to hear this. I'm going to tell you what doesn't work, or I should say what does not have strong evidence that it works. And then I'll talk about what does work, which treatments are supported by evidence. The most common treatments by far are medication or talk therapy or a combination of both. So let's start with medication. Depression and anxiety are extremely common in people with complex trauma. And these days, it's highly likely that those who seek help for these problems will be prescribed antidepressants and or anti-anxiety medication. Now with complex trauma, they can be somewhat helpful to calm intense symptoms, though in many cases, it can delay recovery by dulling awareness or producing a brain fog. And there can be serious side effects, including suicidal and homicidal ideation, sexual difficulties, and a sense of numbness when you're trying to make decisions or connect with people, which are very important parts of recovery. Medications don't offer a cure. Side effects and benefits go away as soon as the medication is discontinued. Traditional talk therapy, including cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, which attempts to replace negative associations with positive ones, is the standard of our times for anything trauma related. And some related kinds of therapy that have been used for trauma for a long time include cognitive processing therapy, exposure therapy, and dialectical behavior therapy. And these focus on aspects of trauma such as memories, sensitivity to triggers, and regulation of emotions. Now talk therapy has helped many people, but research has produced conflicting findings about its effectiveness in treating specifically the effects of trauma in childhood. Therapy and medication are the default treatments for people who are suffering emotionally. And I've heard many people say they found them helpful, but with childhood PTSD, they are more likely to fail than to work. Let me say that again. They are more likely to fail than to work. All the same, 
those treatments absorb almost all insured treatment that people can access. Almost nothing outside of conventional therapy is covered by private insurance or national health programs. And with so many people suffering, why isn't there more curiosity about that? Why isn't there more research and more inclusion of methods that do work in insurance plans? And another problem with the conventional therapy and meds approach is the assumption, mostly debunked, but mostly still dominating the paradigm of providers and insurers that millions of people have a chemical imbalance that can be corrected with drugs and what's needed is to talk about the past which can be triggering for us or even worse paralyzing it's so common for adults who had a hard childhood to go round and round the merry-go-round of the old system, therapy, medication, new therapist, new medication, and so on, and never really recover. And after a while, when hope fades, you might blame yourself or you might justify yourself. What we now know is that childhood PTSD is at its foundation neurological. It develops in relation to brain changes caused by early adversity, abuse, neglect, other intensely stressful conditions. For example, the brain development in a baby who is neglected by parents can be slowed, it can be altered. And instead of learning from a loving parent to connect and feeling comforted by loving touch, a neglected baby is overwhelmed by stress and all the body reactions that come with that. This baby might develop a more or less permanent state of terror that they'll be left alone or they'll learn to escape the flood of emotion and just space out, seeming to need nothing. That's dissociation. These adaptations literally produce changes in brain development and those changes leave us prone to dysregulation. Now, most of the time, most people, including us with trauma, are well-regulated. Brain waves and body systems are working smoothly, evenly, like, like a series of lines flowing along together in a drawing of water. When a stress response is triggered, which happens a lot when you have childhood PTSD, brain waves and body systems like heart rate variability, and that's the way the heart rate and breathing are not, they get disconnected. Your heart rate becomes erratic. It's not like linked to the breathing and they should be kind of going together. Well, they get erratic, like squiggly lines going in all directions. Triggers might be a loud noise, a critical remark by somebody, feeling that you're left out or abandoned, or something embarrassing. And most people might feel some distress at these triggers, but for us, they can launch an emotional explosion, a flood of rage or a flood of shame, or we check out mentally and emotionally. Flooding is often followed by dissociation and all of it is connected to dysregulation. So are you relating to this so far? Have you ever done that, had really intense emotions and then you just kind of go flat? There it is. When you're dysregulated, you lose your train of thought. You, you may lose your ability to find the right words. You may feel clumsy or panicked or lost or, or literally numb. In a dysregulated state, it's very easy to miss danger signals or to emotionally overreact or to make serious life altering social mistakes. And it can be dangerous to drive and it can be really hard to pay attention and remember and communicate and learn. Once you've learned this, it can explain so much about why school has been a challenge, why relationships can be so troubled, and why it is so hard to change. And it can also explain why medication and therapy have not worked so well for childhood PTSD. Now, I just need to say, medication and therapy work really well for some people. And if you're a therapist or a doctor who does not tend to get dysregulated under stress, it must seem like these traditional approaches to treatment would be effective, but there is no clear evidence that they're a good line of treatment. In fact, for people who tend to dysregulate, talking about troubling memories like in therapy can make things worse. We get more upset and less able to think or analyze, and medication can interrupt whatever natural processes may be available to us to re-regulate our brains. It is natural to re-regulate. Most of us can do it, but it's harder. It's harder after trauma but we can learn it. The standard treatment methods of therapy and medication are not specifically designed for re-regulation and their effects don't match very well with our symptoms. 
So what treatments are better tailored to help with dysregulation? As you may have already noticed, I'm personally wary of a lot of professional opinions only because in the past, the help people tried to offer me was usually off base and unhelpful, if not outright harmful. But different people respond to different things. And many, many medical and mental health professionals are actively engaged in new research and revising standard approaches to care and really you know, testing what they're learning with real people and trying to make a difference. There is so much hope. So it's well worth summarizing some of the things other people have found helpful. I was convinced to be open-minded by the excellent book on trauma, uh, Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score. He's a psychiatrist at Harvard who's dedicated his whole career to understanding trauma and what actually helps us. And here are a few things that he's recommended. One is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. It's a powerful technique. It's endorsed by the Veterans Administration that helps to integrate the haunting traumatic memories that are typical of PTSD. In PTSD, the activation of certain memories can produce an intense phys psychological and physiological distress. So, you know, with, with regular old PTSD, like for somebody who, who had a traumatic event, a car accident, a battle, they, they might have nightmares, a pounding heart, outbursts of rage as though the event is happening in this very moment. And these reactions occur again and again, and they don't tend to diminish over time. EMDR involves the use of controlled side-to-side -side eye movements. So like this. It's amazing that that would make a difference, but check it out. Research it online. Um, when I did it, we used vibrating paddles in each hand. You can use various tools that alternately stimulate the left and right brain and the practitioner, they help you to visit traumatic memories and then reprocess them so they become more like a normal memory, remembered but not so intensely charged and repeating and repeating. And the effects of EMDR tend to be pretty long lasting. Occasionally, those who have benefited from it will opt to go back for another EMDR session on the same issue months or years later. And the technique is astonishingly effective at treating adult onset trauma. And when I used it, it was unbelievable how much it helped me with some recent traumatic events. I really didn't expect it to work to help me get over a trauma that had happened when I found a friend uh, dead and I performed CPR for 20 minutes waiting for the ambulance. And as you can imagine, it, it triggered an avalanche of my underlying PTSD symptoms. And I was looping on that panicked reaction every time I thought about it, like 10 times a day for a year. And then I discovered EMDR and it helped me stop doing that looping, looping, looping. And then I can remember what happened. I can talk about it if I choose. It's been a long time now, so I mostly choose not to. Uh, I don't like to encourage the trigger, but I was able to move that memory into a, an actual memory and not just something that was activating my nervous system every time it came to mind. EMDR is not as effective at treating complex trauma, which is the childhood PTSD kind. I had that experience. You can figure out for yourself if it works for you. It does for some. Neurofeedback is another treatment that's gotten some traction out there. The practitioner attaches electrodes to your face and scalp to measure brain activity and monitor when you're in a relaxed state versus a stress response. And you then listen to sounds or watch a video or some kind of stimulus that changes with your brain states. And when I tried it, I watched a travel video on a screen that went from it went dark whenever my brain was unfocused or stressed, and then it brightened when my mind became calm. And you're barely conscious of what you're doing, but apparently our brains can learn from this form of biofeedback to reach a relaxed, alert state and stay there more of the time. Um, and the, you know, the bright screen, I just sort of like, I was watching something happening and when it went dark, I desired, I'm like, come on, I wanna see that, come back. And that was enough to start training my brain to calm down. So, eh. <laughs> it, 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 it kind of worked for me in the end. It wasn't satisfactory for me, but I know a lot of people have benefited. It can take dozens of sessions to get lasting results, which can be a drawback if you don't have really good health insurance or a lot of cash. But a lot of people have found it helpful. Now, I, I didn't expect this, but some of the most promising treatments are using psychedelics, MDA, psilocybin, um, ketamine, for example, to treat not just CPTSD, it's more often used on depression, anxiety, and addiction. 
and clinical trials, as I speak, they're happening. I know some of them are expected to be cleared in the coming year or so. And so by the time you're watching this video, that may be an option clinically is to have supervised use of these, these drugs. Early results show that with trained practitioners, psychedelic therapy could be a good way to break through trauma that's stuck. And I'll be sure to share more when I, you know, when, as findings are published on that. Some other trauma-informed therapies some of my students have valued are lifespan integration therapy, brain spotting, acceptance and commitment therapy, havening, the Wim Hof method, which I happen to love. It includes vigorous deep breathing and cold showers, <laughs> and sometimes dunks in ice water. And it, I do find it gives you a reset. I haven't done the ice yet, but I'm going to. Um, tapping, also called the emotional freedom technique or EFT. It's a technique that a lot of people swear by. And the technique involves actually tapping your, your face, your head, your torso, your hands to quietly calm anxiety and harsh emotions. There are terrific videos on YouTube for free that show you exactly how to do it. Tapping with your fingertips, it's acupressure points or meridians of the body. And some say the benefits are just a placebo effect, but I say, yay, placebos. If it's free and it works, it's a good thing. Writing is free and a simple technique that I rely on heavily to re-regulate is writing. Our self-expression through writing comes from a different part of the brain or a different pathway than speaking. So writing about what's bothering us or what happened to you can be a way around the upset and triggers that we sometimes experience from talking about problems. You can write and you can read to another person and it has been communicated. So huge, huge breakthrough in my life was learning that 30 years ago. That's what my daily practice is about. Some studies suggest that it's the physical action of writing too, using your hand and touching the paper that help to get the thoughts out of your head and somewhere more manageable to process. Uh, you know, we now know that complex PTSD is, it can really injure your ability to process thoughts and emotions, troubling experiences. And by process, we mean it's no longer charged. So that's difficult. That gets jammed up. There's a lot of noise in there. So some people journal to get it out. Some people free associate. I teach everyone who works with me to write what I call uh, the, the daily practice, writing fears and resentments twice a day, followed by meditation. And it's a very specific technique. You can take a free course that I offer, and uh, it's down in the description section always, and learn that for yourself in less than an hour and give it a try. It's a big way that we connect as a community around here. I do calls every two weeks, and my coaches on my team do calls the other weeks, and we'd love it if you wanted to try it and join the calls. You can share it with absolutely anyone. It's also nice to write fears and resentments and meditate with other people. And you can do it even with kids. If kids are too young to write, or for whatever reason an adult is not able to write, you can take dictation for them. And uh, the, 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 there's something about this process, and it's been researched. There's a, there's a um, researcher named Dr. James Pennebaker at the University of Texas in Austin, and he's emeritus at this time, but he has done amazing work researching the power of what he calls expressive writing. There are clinically documented benefits to writing these bad things that happened on paper. And... Uh, I hope to meet him someday. I, I'm in awe of his work. It was so insightful. He's really gotten into something there. I didn't learn my technique from him, but when I started to wonder why is this working, his research is what validated my experience. That's like, wow, so much change for me with that. I was able to, you know, pop out of terrible depression. My brain like sharply focused and then many, many decades of solving life's problems, which I was kind of delayed on. So <laughs> it just keeps getting better. I hope you'll try it. So that brings me, I just want to talk more specifically about meditation. Personally, I, I think most everyone should meditate, especially with people, you know, if you're a person who has emotional difficulties or you have problem paying attention, I know it can be hard for people with dissociation problems too. So maybe not dissociation that can, if that's a trigger, you don't want to do that. But I can't tell you how many people tell me that they, I can't meditate. I think so much. I, you know, I can't calm my mind. And if this is you, never fear. That is why we meditate. That's how we come to it. We can't do it. Our minds are all over the place. And in the simple meditation that I teach, 
There's no requirement to have a still mind. It's okay, you close your eyes and take a rest. Closing your eyes and taking a rest is enough to help your nervous system do a little re-regulating. Sometimes you fall asleep, even better. Naps are great for re-regulation. So I just say that if your mind is just all over the place, it's a good reason to sit down and close your eyes for 20 minutes a couple times a day. You might think you don't have time, but it gives you so much more time because you can pay attention. Your energy will even up. Well, you'll see. You'll see. You can try, you can try my approach. You want to research meditation online? Please do. You can take a class which is helpful, get a teacher or, you know, just watch YouTube videos. I've learned several forms of meditation over year, the years, mindfulness, Vipassana, passage meditation, centering prayer. But the one I've really stuck with regularly for the last 30 years is Vedic meditation. It's also known as transcendental meditation. And I like it because it's super easy. Just using a mantra, it's just a sound. It's a sound, I, I guess, that's understood to kind of you know, help you kind of turn your attention inward. Um, and, and then you focus for 20 minutes on that, if you can, which I, you, I, you barely can, I can't, but that's okay, I come back to it when I remember. You don't have to sit a special way, you can do it in bed, you can do it on a train or in the car, in the passenger seat, don't drive and meditate. And I'm a very busy person, always have been, so this makes it very doable for me. Um, I did it with kids on my lap and they used to consider it a treat to sit on my lap while I meditated because that's how they were raised. They're big now. They don't want to sit on my lap, but they both still use the technique, which is pretty cool. One of them every day. Another category of treatments that help with dysregulation is the physical methods. And this includes yoga, dance, um, martial arts, as well as touch, massage, movement therapies like somatic body work, Feldenkrais, and I know there are many more. These help heal the nervous system and integrate awareness of the, the self and the environment through movement. And it completely makes sense that traumatic memory is stored in the body. Uh, that's sort of a metaphor, but it, but it is. The, you know, there are physiological issues going on and movement sometimes will, feelings will come up. So it sort of supports that notion that it's, it's, it's in there, it's trapped. You can access it and trigger and or soothe your trauma through physical means. And just one very good common sense thing to know, vigorous exercise, like hard enough to break a sweat, is one of the most effective treatments that you can do. You can calm many CPTSD symptoms with your diet, and that's certainly been my experience. Any, yeah, anything that you can do in a positive direction, maybe less sugar in the diet, that's kind of a, um, uh, it feels dysregulating at first and then it makes you a little bit vulnerable to dysregulation. That's certainly my experience and I, I have seen research about that. Um, but just if you, if you can't be a vigorous exerciser, go outside and just move around a little bit. It's a great way to get unfrozen too when you just feel like, I can't move, I can't do anything. Just go outside and you know walk out to the mailbox and back. Dysregulation can make it hard to be intentional about anything, including the food you put in your mouth. But should you become regulated enough that you can start to make food choices, it can really help to eat, um, eat food that has protein, fruits and vegetables, some grain, some fat, but staying away from sugar, flour, and fast carbohydrates and without these, the stimulants of insulin that, especially for traumatized people, I learned this from Susan Pierce Thompson too, for traumatized people, and sometimes people are just born with this, the presence of insulin, it can, it can have a weird relationship with the countervailing hormone, which is leptin, which is there to go, okay, you had your carbs, now you're full and you're content and you can move on. Some of us, that leptin thing is just not working. It's been kind of eroded from trauma or sometimes genetic or sometimes through binging on sugar. You can actually end up with kind of an imbalance there. So you abstain from those very high fast carb foods. And if, if you're seeking to lose weight, you can also really moderate on portions and fast between meals. And those are all things that are actually quite supportive of staying neurologically regulated. It can keep your mood more upbeat and steady too. And some people find coffee can help with staying more regulated neurologically. Other people notice that caffeine totally throws them off. So you can figure that out for yourself. Now, back when I had adult onset PTSD, that time when I found my friend who, who had died, I was obviously drowning in a massive repetitive fight or flight reaction 
It was, it went on for 18 months. And this is right before I learned that what I had was complex PTSD and the, 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 that adult experience was classical PTSD. And my doctor and therapist were pushing medication because for real, adrenal overload like this, where you cortisol, adrenaline all the time, it breaks down your immune system and it opens the door to more serious illness. So any intervention might be better than none. But I did a little online research at the time that suggested, why don't you go do, get some exercise for 45 minutes in the morning and stop eating sugar? <laughs> <laughs> my symptoms went away by about 60% by those two things. And no one had suggested to me. I looked it up. The first week I felt that much better. So I'd recommend you, you, you think about adopting those things, some extra moving around and um, reducing fast carbohydrates in your diet. I can also vouch for yoga. Some gifted professionals have developed yoga practices specifically designed for treating trauma, meaning there is sensitivity around feelings and memories that could be triggered by certain poses or just by moving at all. And an emphasis on being conscious and gentle with whatever may be triggered. More treatments are being tried and tested all the time. Forgive me if I didn't cover some that you know about that are important to you. I hope you'll put them in the comments. I try to keep learning what's out there and I look forward to learning more. And personally, learning about dysregulation was the great turning point for me. Once you understand dysregulation, you may find that you need to rethink a lot of memories you have, beliefs that you have about what happened, whose fault was it, what does it mean about you and your future, beliefs you inherited maybe from therapists and medical professionals and the culture in general that the way your crappy childhood affected you is mainly psychological. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's mainly neurological. The root cause of our childhood PTSD symptoms is neither chemical nor psychological. It's neurological. Those other things may come to pass, but at the basics, it's neurological. Early trauma can cause changes in the developing brain, and this does make us in some ways different than other people. But here's the thing. Trauma is not who you are. It's an injury. And with persistence and open-mindedness, you can break out of old limiting ideas about what is possible for you and instead heal yourself. If you want to learn more about dysregulation and the signs that it's happening and what you can do to re-regulate, you can download this free PDF right here. And I will see you very soon.